2017 was a very weird year for fans of Watchmen. In May, the characters were revived thanks to a jaw-dropping announcement of a follow-up Doomsday Clock. Later that same year, HBO officially greenlit a television series from Damon Lindelof. For characters who, since the 2009 film adaptation by Zack Snyder, had disappeared from the cultural zeitgeist, this was a momentous and surprising development. Watchmen, for those of you who are unaware, is a 12-issue superhero satire. It is a marvellous deconstruction of a genre that so many of us absolutely adore. Since the original miniseries concluded, Moore had declined his involvement in any sequels or spin-offs. For the most part, DC had done a tremendous job by not selling out, and thus tarnishing the legacy of Watchmen. Mr. Moore, will you sign my DVD of Watchmen Babies? Which of the babies is your favorite? You see what those bloody corporations do? They take your ideas and they suck them. Suck them like leeches until they've gotten every last drop of the marrow from your bones. So let's flash forward to June of 2020. It has been a little over six months since both the HBO show and Doomsday Clock concluded. And once more, Watchmen is out of the zeitgeist. However, being an obsessive fan of the Watchmen characters, I adored the HBO show and I read Doomsday Clock. And today, I want to talk about both of these follow-ups and how I believe that there is really only one Watchmen sequel. In both the Doomsday Clock and HBO show, the events of Moore's Watchmen have occurred. In Doomsday Clock, we pick up seven years after the book's conclusion, while on HBO, we begin 27 years later. Almost immediately, something is off with Doomsday Clock when compared to the Moore original, and it's something that I simply cannot vibe with. In its purest form, as I said before, Watchmen is not a superhero comic book. It is a satire of superhero comic books. It's a deconstruction. It's metafiction. It's whatever you want to call it. Alan Moore doesn't want you to think that Rorschach is a badass. He wants you to understand that he's a fucking lunatic. The central flaw I have with Doomsday Clock is by virtue of its existence. The Watchmen characters should never cross over with the DC universe. It's that simple. That's just not what Watchmen is. Look, before I go on, I just want to clarify this. Doomsday Clock is a fine comic book. It's well written, beautifully drawn, and ultimately fun. However, as I just said, that's not what Watchmen is. When you decide to take these characters that perfectly satirize superheroes and force them into a universe that is not satirical, i.e. the DC Universe, you tarnish and compromise what Watchmen is all about. Simply put, you just don't get it. The original Alan Moore text is poking fun at something like Doomsday Clock. It's arguing against these soulless crossovers and events. In fact, the book's decision to have Ozymandias actually win and murder millions of people was a direct attack on the repetition of comic book villains ultimately losing once all the heroes unite. I'm not a comic book villain. Do you seriously think I'd explain my masterstroke to you if there were even the slightest possibility you could affect the outcome? Moore is making fun of the DC Universe, and thus why the editors at DC rejected his original proposal to make Watchmen about pre-existing DC characters. Further proving my point that Watchmen is not a superhero comic book. So you may be asking yourself this, well Robbie, if Watchmen isn't a superhero comic book, what exactly is Watchmen, and how does the HBO show understand it? Lindelof's sequel to Watchmen does not just play the hits or find a way to have Batman bicker with Rorschach. In fact, the sequel completely deconstructs the already broken down nature of the original Watchmen and its characters. Instead of focusing on our favourite characters from the original text, like Night Owl or Silk Spectre, Lindelof chooses to centre the entire story on a character who appeared in merely a few panels from Moore's original Watchmen. Now sure, Silk Spectre does appear, as does Odyssey Mandius, but their characters take on a different layer here. They evolve in a unique way. They don't just exist to be reminders of how cool Watchmen is. Instead of Rorschach inspiring a man to do a similar thing as seen in Doomsday Clock, 
In the HBO version, Rorschach's journal ultimately inspires a white nationalist movement, hell-bent on using Dr. Manhattan's powers to turn their grand wizard into God. Guys, the HBO show fucking slaps. Additionally, Lindelof's show actually uses these new characters to enhance the previously established themes of Watchmen. The show's lead, Angela Abar, is a tremendous character whose journey of self-discovery, acceptance, and love is nothing short of beautiful. In a traditional superhero structure, a tragic event occurs, thus inspiring a character which, most of the time, concludes with said character out in a badass costume swearing vengeance. With Abar, Lindelof flips it showing the character in her costume from the beginning, slowly stripping that away, stripping that superficial component as she heals from her own trauma. In one of my favourite scenes in fucking anything, Abar and her grandfather William Reeves, the original Hooded Justice, states, You can't heal under a mask, Angela. It is a scene that perfectly summarizes the entirety of Watchmen. Moore's original piece relies heavily on the idea of masking your pain, as evident in Ozymandias' plan to create a mask for the world in the form of a giant squid, which he blames for the death of millions, and inadvertently inspires movements like the white nationalist group, the Seventh Cavalry. Instead of allowing people to solve their own problems or heal their wounds, Ozymandias uses a fear-inducing mask, and it simply doesn't work. Now look, I'd probably be kinder to Doomsday Clock if it didn't have the misfortune of being released around the same time as the HBO show. Personally, I find it super weird that DC and Jeff Johns, of all people, would even consider using the characters of Watchmen as a springboard for a comic book crossover that, like all comic book crossovers, was pointless. Watchmen is anything but pointless. It's the show's refusal to yield to nostalgia and its ability to put stories and characters first that leads me to believe that Lindelof's HBO adaptation of Watchmen is the only Watchmen sequel.